It was about 10 years ago, right this time of year, that I was preparing myself for what for me would be one of the most important celebrations of Christmas that I had ever had. I um, was getting ready, I was preparing to welcome a very special lady guest to my house. And I had hoped to give that very special lady guest who was coming from across the ocean to visit me a very special, shiny Christmas present. Now I'll let you figure out who I'm talking about. Um, But uh, when I moved to Austin, Texas for this vicar year, I inherited a large house, far too big for a bachelor, so I was also given a housemate from the vicar, that's a pastoral student, who came before me. And my roommate, my housemate and I, we had different views of how clean a house should be and who should do it. It was his view, since he lived there longer than me, and since he had to pay perhaps a little more in rent, that I should have to clean up the house after him, after his dishes, after his laundry even. And it was my view that he should clean up after himself. Now, You can imagine, after a few weeks of living there since August of that year, a a silent war, if you would, started between us. As the pile of dishes grew and I stopped, refused to clean up after him anymore, and pretty soon some small, undesirable, little tiny creature started to grow in those very dishes, and had a government agent or official come to my house, it's pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they would have condemned the house for what that kitchen looked like. But now it was December. And now I was getting ready, preparing myself for this special lady guest to come and to give her that special Christmas present. So it was time to get out the disinfectant, and the rubber gloves. It's time to to give in and clean up the house. I hope that your Christmas preparations this year don't involve as many paper towels and as much Lysol as it took me that year. But the fact is that this is a season of preparation. We are all getting ready to celebrate Christmas, perhaps in our own ways. Maybe you are making plans Plans to visit family who live far away so you have a big trip to plan for. Or maybe you're planning to receive guests who come from afar so like me you have to clean your house top to bottom. Perhaps your Christmas preparations include baking Christmas cookies or other Christmas treats or going shopping to buy just the right kind of gift and then wrapping it and then giving it or attending concerts, or participating in concerts. I mean, the list goes on and on. On the one hand, these kinds of preparations for Christmas are a lot of fun. Because this is the only time of year we get to do these kinds of things. On the other hand, though, if that is the only way we are preparing to celebrate Christmas, then we are missing out on what John the Baptist has to say to us today in our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 3. God wants us to be prepared at Christmas to receive the greatest gift of all, that he would send his son into the world to be our savior, to make us right with him, and to be ready to receive our savior into our hearts at Christmas. And God wants all people to be ready, so Before Jesus came, he sent John the Baptist in order to prepare people's hearts. In fact, that was John's entire life purpose, getting people ready to receive their Savior. And when he finally came, well, it was pretty surprising because for 400 years before John the Baptist came, There was complete silence from God, no prophets, no messages, until one day John came, and as we hear in our gospel lesson, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, 
in the desert. Why? Well, because God wants us to be prepared to receive him. And after 400 years, God needed a a messenger. He needed someone to get people ready. And so John came. He came and he went out to the Jordan River and started preaching a message. And the people came out to see him. I mean, he was kind of a Kind of a strange guy, living out in the wilderness, dressed in clothes that he made from camel's hair, and eating locusts, grasshoppers, and wild honey as his food. And what was his message? Well, as we anticipate our Savior to come, which is what we're considering this Advent season, this anticipation We want to be prepared. Be prepared inwardly and outwardly for him to come. So what was John's message? That if we were to have gone out and listened to him preaching in the wilderness, what would his message have been to us? Well, that's exactly what Luke tells us as we read in our text. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You know, if I was going to preach a message like John the Baptist, I don't think my first, the first words I would share with them are, you brood of vipers. I mean, when you think about it, these people had hiked out into the wilderness a full day just to hear what John had to say, and that's the way he welcomed them? We would expect him to welcome Maybe someone who is, is a bad person in God's sight or a, a self-righteous person like the Pharisees or, the, or the, the Sadducees or the enemies of Jesus. But that's not the kind of person who we hear coming out to John. We hear about tax collectors. We hear about soldiers and just people who wanted to listen to them. When you consider the stories about John the Baptist, you find that he was preaching a message to two different categories of people. People who on one hand were, they were outwardly prepared to receive and to meet the Messiah, but inwardly they were far from it. And then there were some people who might seem inwardly prepared for Jesus to come, but outwardly there was still a lot of work to do. Well, this first group, those who were outwardly prepared for the Savior to come, but inwardly they weren't, Luke doesn't really talk about this group in his lesson here. The only reason we know that this group was there is because in the other three Gospels, they're front and center in this story. And they were the religious leaders, the chief priests, the Pharisees, People who, when you looked at them on the outside, they looked ready in every way for the Messiah, the Savior to come. If you were to go into their home, if they had a home in Vancouver today, and they were getting ready for Christmas, it would look perfect. The outside of their house would be covered with Christmas lights. Their holly, their bushes would be trimmed just right. Inside, you would find this gorgeous Christmas tree decorated with lights, with presents under it, and stockings hung over the fireplace. It would be absolutely perfect. You probably couldn't walk to their house without smelling the sweet smell of cookies baking, floating through the air. And yet, inwardly, their preparations are a far different story. 
the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they didn't think that the coming Messiah was coming because they needed him, because there was something wrong between them and God. They thought, we are doing pretty well just on our own. And we know this because they kept talking time and time again about how they were sons of Abraham. They had the perfect lineage as Jews, which was something we talked about last week, sort of. And they made a show of all the religious activities that they did. But that's the thing. It really wasn't anything more than a show. The inside of their hearts, they didn't bother to clean that out. And over time, the inside of their hearts looked a bit more like the inside of my vicar home, especially the kitchen. In our own prep, if our own preparations for Christmas are all about decorations and presents and all the fun things you get to do at Christmas, but not about what John is saying, then we're missing out on his main point. It's kind of like what happens when you're trying to get ready for someone to come to your home, whether it's a special lady guest or family members or whoever it might be, and Instead of actually cleaning your home and preparing for them to come, you start to shove things under the bed. We've all done that before, right? Hiding things in the closet, under the bed, closing the door. But if we, are, if we think that that's all it takes to be ready for Jesus, then that means we're leaving things buried inside of our hearts. Shameful things that we don't want anyone else to know about, but we're just going to pretend that they're not there. Pretend as if it's no big deal. And you hear what John has to say about that. That such trees, using his illustration, should be cut down and thrown in the fire. But this is exactly why John came. John went into the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John was preaching repentance. He was preaching a turnaround. He wants us to go inside of our hearts and to scrub it down, to clean out everything inside of our hearts, to clean out the dirty dishes, wash the floors, scrub down the pride, Get out the industrial strength soap and wash off your tongue for all the words you may have said that hurt others. Throw away the secret stash of lustful thoughts and get rid of them. Get rid of the materialism inside of your heart and put that in the recycling bin. Just get rid of it. Clean out your heart top to bottom. Repent. That was his message. He wants us to take a deep look, to self-reflect, to look at ourselves in the mirror of God's law and realize that this little baby coming at Christmas, he's not just cute. He's coming because he needs to die for us, for our sins, for the things that we don't want the world to know about. We don't want God to know about. But thankfully, John was equipped. He was sent by God with with a special cleaning solution. A way to wash all of this out better than the best cleaning solutions you can buy in the store. He was coming with the power of water and the word of God. He was coming to baptize. That's That's why we call him John the Baptist. And in this baptism, God is the one who comes in and gives us the full service cleaning that our hearts need. Inside and out, top to bottom, he scrubs them down and cleans them out. Every bit of dirt, every bit of shameful sin, every evil thought, every jealous thought that we have, clears it out, washes it clean. John's baptism was only different from the one that you and I receive 
in that his baptism pointed ahead to the coming Savior. But when you look at your baptism, and when you think about your baptism, you look back at what Jesus came to do for you, to make you clean in God's sight, to make you completely prepared inwardly. So when you are preparing your heart for Jesus to come, that's what we do. We look back at our baptism. We think about the fact that in baptism, God sent his Holy Spirit into us and made us clean in God's sight. He clothed us in the robes of God's righteousness so that as we stand before God, we have nothing to hide. If God came to visit your house and looked in every closet and in every drawer, he would find nothing but tidiness, cleanliness, and purity. This is the beauty of what baptism is and why God gives it to us and prepares us to meet our Savior in this way. And John is preaching that to you and to me and even to those Pharisees who might not think they need it. But there was also a second group of people, those who, they might have seemed more inwardly prepared, but outwardly there was still a lot that they needed to do. This was the group of people, the the tax collectors, the, the sinners, the soldiers, people who were just there because they wanted to be there, that John was speaking to in our verses. And this is the encouragement that John gives them. He says, when they asked him, what should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do, he replied. Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. We can be inwardly prepared, repentant, to receive our Savior at Christmas. But there is this element of outward preparation that is also good to do. Not just about Christmas trees, but the kind of outward preparation that John was trying to teach these people. But it's a little bit trickier to describe because for each person that preparation is a little bit different. And you can see that by the way John talks differently to all the different groups of people, whether the soldiers or the tax collectors or other people who came to him. And if you and I had come to the Jordan River and John spoke to us, well, the encouragement he gave you would give you would be different as well. But we can get a good sense of it if we go back to the beginning of his message and remember this verse, verse 8 in our text. He says, Produce fruit... In keeping with repentance. Produce fruit. Prepare yourself with acts of love to receive God when he comes. Now let's say back in that day in Austin, while I was vicaring and getting ready for this special guest to come, and I had cleaned out my entire house, gotten rid of all of my my housemates' trash that was piled up in the garage and all the dirty dishes and cleaned the whole house. It was Top to bottom, it was, as we say in English, spick and span. It was perfectly clean. Would that be enough? Is that enough to express to this special guest that I like her so much that I might want her to stay on a more permanent basis as, say, a wife? Hardly. No, to get ready for that, I needed more. I needed a Christmas tree in my house. I needed glowing lights on it. I needed a present with her name on it under that tree. I needed to get ready for her to come because she was going to be flying in. After 40 hours on the plane and she really wanted some Mexican food, find a good Mexican restaurant. We're going. And most importantly, I needed to get that little shiny Christmas present that I had been long planning to get for her. You see, the fruit that John is talking about in repentance is much like that. Because when we love what Jesus is coming to do for us, it leads us to want to act on that, to show our love to him. 
And in some cases, it's really obvious how we can do that. Because if you have fallen into a sin and you have repented of it, well, then the obvious thing to do is to stop that sin, to turn away from it, to stop doing it. And if by your sin you hurt someone or you stole something from someone, well, then you can take the opportunity to make it right again as best as you can. If God has called you to serve and the way that you fell into sin was by not doing that, then perhaps you can start serving your family, being faithful in your work, taking care of people in your life who need your help. Those are all the kinds of fruits of repentance that John is calling on us to do as well. But we don't have to stop there. We can express our love and our gratitude that Jesus is coming at Christmas, that he came for us 2,000 years ago in, in so many different ways that it's impossible to begin to list them all off. But we don't have to do them all. We can just start with one or two. By worshiping God in the actions that we make with our life, by serving one another with a loving and cheerful and joyful attitude, by sharing our faith with the people around us in our lives, we can show God we are prepared for him to come in outward ways as well to express the deep gratitude that we have, that he has washed us clean and made us right to stand before him someday. I am happy to report that after all of those preparations, the house did get cleaned out from top to bottom. It was clean. There was a Christmas tree. It had lights on it even. And when my very special lady guest came, well, let's just say she liked my Christmas presents so much that she's still wearing it. May you also be prepared for your Savior to come at Christmas. Amen.